Hi, it's Adam from Zero Friction Cycling, and uh, today just going to be going through the Zero Friction Cycling Wear Correlation Test. Uh, I'll call this video one because I'll probably be doing a follow up um, in a bit more depth. Uh, this video is just, I'm just going to be doing, um, I guess, broad brush uh, on the test and just a, a little bit of, I guess, demonstration in regards to uh, how the test is run, how the contamination is added. Um, uh, it's just something that, yeah, a lot of people have been interested in, uh, including a lot of manufacturers. They, they sort of want to see a little bit more about how the test is run. Um, so before I get to that, though, it's, I guess, important to do a quick run through on why I went down the wear correlation path for my testing, as opposed to um, you would have seen in the, I guess, the you know, first off friction facts uh, started testing uh, providing uh, outright efficiency loss number, which was which was brilliant. That was really what started, um, you know, really so much activity in this space. Really, um, a lot of the products that we have today, um, and you know, even I guess the evolution of you know, zero friction cycling, um, you know, with me starting that up, wouldn't have happened without that initial groundwork by uh, Friction Facts. So, uh, yeah, so there's I guess a lot to be sort of thankful for there. And I've had, I guess I've had the, the fun of, um, you know, dealing with uh, and, and, you know, badgering Jason Smith of Friction Facts uh, about, you know, a lot of testing stuff and, and information for a long time. Um, so it's been, yeah, sort of great, great learning and, and really helped shape, you know, which way I should go here. Um, and I'm going to be doing a video covering um, the, I guess, the testing landscape at the moment um, to, to further on from... Uh, there was a podcast uh, that myself um, and Jason Smith and David Rome did uh, with Cycling Tips Nerd Alert, uh, where we do a bit of a deep dive on um, chain lubricant efficiency testing overall. And because um, what we're what what's happening is that um, there's a lot of manufacturers um, and even I guess sort of independent um, companies that are you know in or stepping into the testing space or have stepped into the testing space. Um, but trying to get that outright efficiency loss number, uh, it, it's, it's extremely difficult to, to make sure that that's accurate. So there's, there's so many factors that can, um, I guess, have, have that number come out a bit wobbly or simply just not align with another um, you know, test lab. So, you know, like for instance, um, one example that I used in the, in the podcast was that, um, say, Squirt, which is an often um, benchmark lubricant, um, so Ceramic Speed uh, Denmark Lab currently have Squirt, uh, the new formula, um, that's at uh, just over four watts efficiency loss. Um, Markoff tested that as part of their nano chain launch and they came out with 8.5 watts. Uh, Wheel Energy tested Squirt for, uh, as part of the Graphene Lube launch and on the Wheel Energy testing it started at initially just over seven watts, uh, quite quickly went down to just over five watts and then quite quickly went up to, uh, I think it was over 10 watts. Um, and Allied, uh, who've come to market with Grax, they had a third party do their um, efficiency testing and they developed a machine uh, for this uh, test. Uh, their method's quite different. So they, they had basically Grax at 22 watts and uh, Squirt at 28 watts. So I think it's sort of measuring like an entire drivetrain and so if we say that Grax is then, say, a 5-watt loss lube, that would have Squirt at, say, circa 11 watts, or if Grax is a 4-watt lube, then Squirt would be at circa 10 watts. So we've got numbers that are, you know, they're all over the place from one test lab to another. Um, there's a lot of reasons as to why that occurs um, and or why we believe that they occur, which we go through um, in depth in that uh, Cycling Tips Nerd Alert podcast. So... Um, yeah, if you haven't listened to it already, I, yeah, I think that's a great one to listen to because um, that explains a fair bit about what's going on there, um, hopefully what we can do to try to clean up that testing landscape. Um, but it also uh, helps explain why uh, for zero friction cycling testing, why I went down a wear correlation path as opposed to trying to get this efficiency loss number. Uh, so um, yeah, a lot of things can come into play to make that loss number not align with other labs or be wonky. Wear correlation, um, if you've got a really, I guess, a really well thought out test protocol, and this, the test protocol that I use, uh, we spent you know, quite a lot of time to make sure that uh, you know, the test protocol was going to be able to do a number of important things that uh, the friction facts testing uh, didn't uh, do. That was really focused on 
just getting that outright efficiency number. I really wanted to expand on that. So I wanted the testing that I do to check whether or not a lubricant has any initial penetration issues. Um, I want to check how a lubricant performs when it's exposed to dry contamination. Um, so a lot of lubricants claim that they you know, repel dirt, dust and grime, uh, that they clean as they lubricate and so on. So by being able to run the test for you know, thousands of kilometres with um, you know, contamination blocks in there as well, that enables me to see, just by checking how the wear rate's going, how well it's actually um, the lubricant is, is holding up to that claim. Um, I want to test how well a lubricant performs in you know, um, harsh wet conditions. And you know, finally, I want to test um, how well the lubricant performs in extreme uh, contamination conditions. Um, by having alternating clean blocks, so there's uh, initially when a test starts, it starts with a, with a clean block, then we move to a dry contamination block, then I move to another clean block. So within that span, what we get to see is from the wear rate is do we have any initial penetration issues? So if a chain shows a very high wear rate initially and then that wear rate drops, then we, we know that there's some initial penetration issues with the lubricant. And what I do uh, also um, later on in the test uh, when I move to um, what's called the sim single application longevity part, so how long do the lubricants last just on a single treatment, uh, for that test, the lubricants are applied via immersive application. And so then we get to see the initial wear rate um, for when I've applied the lubricant via immersive and you know, compare that to obviously how it's gone when I've applied the lubricant as per the manufacturer instructions. And it gives us a bit of a double blind uh, check with regards to whether or not a lubricant does have any initial penetration issues or not. And that comes in super handy with regards to you know, how you, what level you need to go to when you're, you know, prepping your own chain. Um, for instance, a lot of the testing, so I did a lot of testing for Absolute Black with the graphene, um, and that did show um, initial penetration issues. And that's why when you buy a bottle of graphene lube that, you know, it comes with a bag and very, very, you know, excellent precise instructions on how to apply the initial prep for the graphene lube once you've perfectly cleaned the chain. Um, because you really do need to uh, do that application immersive or you'll have, you know, it just, it just won't penetrate right deep into the chain into the pin and so you get high friction, high wear. Um, and there are a lot of other lubricants that honestly, they're, they're actually really good lubricants but because they don't specify that you should do the initial application via immersive, um, that, you know, they really give you quite high wear initially until it finally gets in there. And these lubricants would have performed much better in the zero friction cycling test um, had the uh, manufacturer you know, instructed users to do the application initially via immersive. Um, but you know, they don't want to do that. It's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a scary step for manufacturers to say that because if one bottle says uh, you need to take the chain off and um, apply this lubricant via immersive and another lubricant says, hey, you're all super if you just drip it on top of the chain, a lot of people are just going to buy the one that says, hey, you can just drip it on top of the chain. And, you know, most times as we see, consumers don't know that, you know, they're getting that really high wear rate to start with. You don't feel it. You don't notice it. But in a controlled test, we can definitely measure it. And so, uh, so we see that come up. Also, by moving between um, initial clean block, uh, assessing for the initial penetration issues, to then a dry contamination block, back to a clean block, not only... Uh, can I assess how well the lubricant is able to resist that dry contamination being absorbed and becoming, uh, you know, making the lubricant quite abrasive. But when I stop adding the contamination, then I get to see how well that lubricant is able to clear uh, the contamination that has been added. So, you know, lubricants that are claiming to clean as they lubricate, we'll kind of, you know, sort of see if that comes, you know, through or not. So, um, some lubricants do have some ability to, I guess, sort of flush clean or move out the contamination inside. Uh, some lubricants, the wear rate continues to increase even once I've stopped adding the contamination. It just, just doesn't get uh, any better. It can't clear it out and the, the, yeah, the, the lubricant just stays, you know, ever more abrasive. Um, and so then, so block one's clean, block two is dry contamination, block three is clean again. Block four, I'm moving to wet contamination. So now I'm blasting the chain with water and the dry contamination that's being added. Uh, that 
is the death of a lot of lubricants, um, and a lot of lubricants don't make it past uh, block four. Uh, although having said that, many more these days than were when I started zero friction cycling. Uh, a lot of the lubricants I've been testing lately are much, much better um, than they were, and we're getting a lot more uh, lubricants going all the way through the test. Um, after block four, which is the wet contamination, again, we move back to a clean block to a again allow the chain to show or the lubricant to show how well it's able to um, get itself back to an okay state after being subjected to, to some pretty harsh conditions and then the final block block six is an extreme contamination um, so it's being blasted with double the amount of water double the amount of abrasive contamination and that is being applied at double the uh, the intervals so it's a really big step up and yeah, back in the day, like pretty much no drip lubricant uh, remotely came close to making it through that block. Uh, whereas recently we've had um, you know, a number of uh, lubricants that have, that have made it all the way through even the extreme contamination block uh, with UFO drip being uh, the first. So um, yeah, things have really, really moved up uh, very well. Um, so what's a block uh, and what's an interval? So the blocks are 1,000 kilometres long and within that 1,000 kilometres there are intervals. So uh, there are 400 kilometres run which is depending on the, the cog. So each, each interval we do change the gears. Um, so it depends on what, what gear but the, the flat simulation blocks which is in the big ring are going to range somewhere between basically 9 hours and 12 hours. Uh, which is um, usually fine uh, interval length for, for most lubricants. They, they, sh they shouldn't really struggle to, to make that uh, time span. Uh, then it moves to 200 kilometres of hill simulation, so it moves to the small ring and the larger cogs, uh, and then back to 400 kilometres on to the big ring for another flat simulation, and then that will be the end of block one. There's a re-lube, obviously, um, at the end of each interval, so it's lubricated as per manufacturer instructions at the start. Then after 400 kilometres, then after the next 200 kilometre uh, hill simulation, which will come in again in the same sort of uh, you know hour span, depending on which cog between sort of nine and 12 hours, re-lubricated and back to the next um, uh, flat simulation. Block two, like it, it, it just continues the alternation. So block two will actually start in the small chain ring for the hill simulation. So um, it just keeps going on and then within that block, not only are there the specific re-lubrication intervals, but there's the specific intervals where I'm adding the, um, the contamination. So uh, obviously the load is controlled by the smart trainer um, and uh, all the intervals are obviously for every test, they're, you know, they're the same interval lengths. The re-lubrication um, is at the same points, the contamination in addition is the exact same contamination applied um, the same amount in the same manner. And so that, that gives us a very controlled uh, test. Uh, the variance for the zero friction cycling testing is, has come out, we've done over 300,000 kilometers of controlled testing now. And a lot of tests have been repeated, um, you know, I guess just to obviously keep checking uh, what variance that we're in. And uh, we're staying within plus minus 5%. So what that means is, um, you know, if a lubricant in one test, if it made it to say uh, 4,000 kilometres before it hit its 0.5% um, wear allowance, uh, plus minus 5% on that. In another test, uh, if I was to redo the same test, maybe it would make it to 4,200 kilometres or maybe it would um, reach that limit at 3,800 kilometres. So that's pretty much the test variance. Um, how does that compare to real world? Um, so real world testing is actually really, really... Um, not very accurate testing at all. So uh, pre-zero friction cycling days, being a nerdy cyclist, I actually kept, and I still do, I keep track of everything. And I tested nine chains, nine of my training chains, uh, same lubricant, same maintenance in my just normal training. And I achieved uh, basically to 0.5% where in, they lasted anywhere from basically 4,000 kilometres to 6,500 kilometres. So that's a plus minus of basically 62.5%. So with real world testing, and where this falls over a lot for you know online publications or other people that are trying to do testing for um, you know lubricants for a you know article or themselves or whatever it may be, you know little differences add up to a lot. So, for instance, you might go for a ride, 
and you might have a bit of contamination that hits the chain fairly early in the ride and then it's a really you know high power interval training session that's going to have a really big impact on the wear rate of the chain versus if that was just um, a light cruise and in terms of total lifespan of a chain uh, you know if if your training chain goes out and gets a couple of solid wet rides quite early in, in its life and you know you've got pretty average maintenance or no maintenance the impact on that chain's um, total lifespan is, is massive versus if it went for a really good stretch just in dry riding to start with and got hit with some wet rides uh, you know, later on. Uh, where do you live? What's the contamination like? Do you ride along the beach lot where there's a lot of sand on the roads? Um, is it quite dusty? You know, even, even if you're road riding, is it sort of dusty where you live or not? So the type, the amount, when it's introduced, what power are you doing? after the contamination is introduced, all of that stuff just makes real world uh, you know, testing. Um, even if you're wear tracking, you have to do a whole lot of chains um, to get basically a ballpark figure for, uh, for that um, lubricant. So now this is done, this real world testing can be a great tool and, and it is done well by some manufacturers who are working with um, athlete teams, but you need, you need basically a lot of athletes and you need a lot of data to get real world testing to help back your sort of lab claims and tribology testing and so on. Um, so yeah, just because the variance is, is so big. And so this is where the, the zero friction cycling uh, wear rate correlation testing, because I guess it, it's kind of like a more of a real world nature, but you know, everything's controlled. We've got a much tighter um, variance on our results and we, we just get so much information from the results, um, you know, all the way from initial penetration issues to dry contamination resistance, ability to clear contamination, wet contamination resistance, extreme contamination performance. You know, there, there's, we get a really huge um, amount of information from this test, which is why it's, you know, it's being used a lot now by um, a lot of the major manufacturers around the world to help back up their, their own testing and obviously get an, an independent result for their lubricant versus just you know, their own test saying it, it's amazing. So um, I've got, uh, I started with one machine, I've now got three test machines and um, I'm going to be building up a fourth just for race chain prep because I, I can't keep up with uh, race chain prep trying to do it in between uh, tests. So it's been all, all flat out. So um, what we'll do now, um, yeah, is that we'll, we'll sort of show you how I um, apply the dry contamination and what the dry contamination is. Um, for the full test, protocol. I've got the full test protocol on the lubricant test page on the Zero Friction Cycling website. So if you want to go through the entire test protocol, basically interval by interval, it steps the entire uh, process out. Uh, it's all up online and, uh, and how it all works is all there. So you can, you can go through it in full uh, at your leisure. But that's, uh, I guess, an introduction into it. And uh, yeah, we'll get the machines running and we'll show you how we uh, add the contamination. Okay, so yeah, um, just continuing on in the uh, zero friction cycling wear correlation test video one. So I'm just going to demonstrate adding the dry contamination, which would normally uh, be block two. Uh, so throughout the 1000 kilometer block two, dry contamination is added uh, seven times throughout that block. Uh, so I've got the machine up and running now. So it's set to uh, 250 watts um, resistance load at the trainer. Um, I'm able to maintain, so I keep an eye on the cadence. If a lubricant starts performing really poorly, um, it may need more uh, power. So I can control the voltage as needed um, to control the cadence with the motor to keep the cadence the same. Uh, cadence needs to remain pretty tightly controlled because uh, lower cadence for the same power puts more tension on the chain, whereas higher cadence for the same power is less tension on the chain, so that, that can just change the result. Uh, you can see, so we've got, um, uh, industrial motor and gearbox. Um, this motor is not super powerful. You've probably got some uh, e-bike motors that are about the same power as this, but they won't last as long. Uh, this motor and gearbox um, weighs pretty much on 12 kilograms, um, but it's rated for uh, eight hours work a day, every day of the week for 30 years. Um, so there's probably not too many e-bike motors that will uh, manage to equal that. So they're super reliable. And you can sort of see, I guess, a bit with the, the mounting, because it's not a millimetre perfect engineered uh, bench, um, if you're not going to get a super precise engineered uh, bench and coupling, 
The other way of going about things is just to allow things to have a bit of float. Um, otherwise, the whole lot would be rocking around. So um, we've got uh, a coupling that allows for a bit of float and also the actual mounting bench just allows things to float and then everything's sweet. Uh, all the bearings are happy. They're not put under uh, really high, high stress. And um, yeah, the original motor and gearbox um, for the testing is, has done over a quarter of a million Ks and these uh, two newly built ones are fast clocking up the kilometers. Uh, so yeah, so I'll move to the, the, the actual contamination itself is just basically sandy loam um, that's graded. So it's basically a very consistent particle size. Um, and I've got 20 kilograms of it. So I've got a pretty good supply. And in the dry contamination block, we're adding half a teaspoon, which is five grams. And so everything's pretty low tech and deliberately so. Uh, it's low tech because that makes it really super easy and really super robust. It's, it's very hard to go wrong. The more, if you overcomplicate something that can be done simply, uh, you can just introduce more problems. So uh, doing a couple of demonstrations. So this is applying dry contamination to, this is just my wax chain that I just took off my bike as opposed to the test chain, which is not um, having contamination added. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna show you what it's like when we add contamination or dry contamination to a, uh, like a dry lube chain. So your molten speed wax, your hot melt, and you get a very, very, very similar uh, kind of result with your chain coating type lubricants like UFO Drip, Silk is Super Secret, True Tension Tungsten. Um, because they set to like a solid coating, their dry contamination resistance is very high. So you won't hear a lot of change uh, because most of the dry contamination just bounces off. After this one, we'll move to another machine uh, where it's just set up with a, a wet lubricant chain. And you'll hear the difference in how much contamination is absorbed with a wet lubricant. And why I keep recommending that if you ride off-road that wet lubricants probably aren't the, uh, the top choice in general. So this I'll move over to basically the same spot and the same height. And I just release the contamination onto the chain. So we can hear there's a change in sound as that contamination. So this um, just releases the contamination at a controlled rate. Uh, and that's it, that's the five grams of contamination added. So now if we listen, we're about probably 30 seconds in since I added it and there's really no change to the sound of the chain. Um, so you'll, you'll hear quite a stark contrast to that when I add the uh, dry contamination to a wet lube chain. Uh, but yeah, so that's how I add dry contamination. And uh, yeah, simple, which means it's robust, very, very easily um, repeatable the exact same way every single time, uh, which is how we're able to maintain those, uh, those, uh, that, that test variance rate. So that is uh, that one. So we'll uh, yeah, now move to adding the dry contamination to a wet loop chain. So yeah, just following on from before, so I just showed the adding dry contamination to um, a solid uh, lubricant chain uh, or chain coating. Uh, now I'm going to show or demonstrate adding exactly the same uh, dry contamination to a uh, wet lubricant chain. Um, this is uh, very just basically stereotypical of what I hear uh, with wet lubricants versus dry lubricants. So we'll see if this hopefully picks up on the, uh, on the video okay, see if we notice the difference. So we can hear that grinding away. You know, so much more has been absorbed. And it's just continuing on and continuing on. And that is just gonna keep grinding away, uh, making this really not great sound for a, a good while, probably a good sort of 10 or so minutes. Um, and it will slowly dissipate down as basically the contamination itself is ground up into finer and finer and finer uh, particles. Um, but hopefully that sound has picked up okay on the video to show the difference in how much dry contamination is absorbed between um, a solid coating chain lubricant versus a, um, a wet lubricant. 
So I'll stop that now just so that I can ramble on a little bit. So um, yeah, so if that, if that sound picked up well, hopefully um, you may start to get, uh, I guess, a bit of an inkling as to why I'm uh, always, I guess, hammering home that if you, you know, ride off road uh, in the world of sort of dirt and dust, that, um, you know, choosing to run a, you know, immersive wax or a solid chain coating type lubricant versus a wet lubricant, it's going to save you a ton of money. Um, so the, the wear test data is all up on the Zero Friction Cycling Lubricant Test page. So you can see for yourself uh, the average wear rates for you know, the, the top lubricants tested, which have all come out as the chain coating type lubricants versus uh, wet lubricants. So the wear rate, the average wear rates for the, the top chain coating lubricants versus even the best um, wet lubricants, um, it's uh, I, from memory, I believe that the, the top five chain coating lubricants are you know, under a fifth the wear rate of uh, even the top five wet lubricants tested. Now, within that, within the wet lubricants, there's a huge variance, um, you know, yet again, between the top lubricants and your average to poor lubricants. So your top lubricants do an admirable job um, at, I guess, being less bad at, picking, at picking up dust in um, off-road riding. Uh, so lubricants such as, say, uh, your Silk is Synergetic, um, part of this, I guess, the, the key with, with that, uh, and also Nix Friction, is that so little lubricant is needed to you know, really effectively lubricate the chain that they're simply less wet um, and with less um, you know, I guess wet chain, then it's less is going to stick and it's also not going to travel from outside the chain to inside the chain as easily. So they do do a lot better. Um, the, the not very you know, great uh, wet lubricants, their wear rates in you know, off-road riding can be and often is you know, quite astoundingly bad. Um, and it, it's amazing, like it, it's still, I guess it's something that, that by and large, by still a lot of the cycling demographic, it's kind of something that's still accepted as like, this is normal. It's like I, I drip lube on my chain and I wipe it and I go ride and I just do that and things get black and messy and um, you know, things wear out really quickly, but at some stage I just sort of replace my chain, my cassette and my chain ring um, and just sort of rinse and repeat. Um, but you know, compared to what you can get from the top known lubricants where everything stays super clean, massively lower wear rates, massively easier maintenance um, with you know, literally either just wiping that, the chain with a methylated spirits cloth um, before you re-lube or re-wax, uh, or you know, post wet rides doing your boiling water flush rinse, like it's just so easy, no solvents. Uh, whereas to reset a chain after you know a few decent uh, dusty rides with a wet lube, you know, it's a lot of solvents, especially if it's uh, you know not a great wet lube. Now, um, yeah, there's a big difference as well. The reason why a lot of wet lubricants just do a really really poor job in uh, lubricating your chain in high contamination conditions is that a lot of the lubricants out on the shelf, they're not, you know, ground up huge development um, to be an awesome chain lubricant like the top wet lubricants are. So if you look at, say, your Nix Friction and your Silk Synergetic and now, you know, um, been doing a lot of testing with, uh, you know, Rex with their products and Revo Lubes, the development of that's gone into those lubricants you know, is, is pretty massive. So the, the time, effort and resources put in a lot of lubricants that, um, that we get uh, off the shelf are just lubricants that are from, you know, other major industries. So it's a lubricant made by a big industry uh, player in whatever field it may be. And it's just basically a lubricant and it's rebottled and rebranded as a cycling lubricant. Uh, now, it might be quite a good lubricant in itself in a particular application but um, it's not a great lubricant for a bicycle chain that's going to go out and hit the world of dirt and dust. It's just going to become quite quickly a grinding paste that's going to eat through uh, your components. Um, and so, yeah, I guess trying to, part of the focus now for, for zero friction cycling really is to try to just keep hammering home what, what's going to be the best lube choice for yourself, for your type of riding, um, your you know, level of maintenance, comfort and, and whatnot. So, um, you know, some people it's just like, you know what, I'm just going to keep adding 
my whatever wet lube and wipe and chain and that's cool for me and it, you know like if that's you that's that's all groovy but for um you know for those that are thinking you know what maybe there is a better way and uh like the cost to run difference so i've got all cost to run modeling on the the website as well literally the cost to run difference between your, your top lubricant choices and even your, just your not not the worst ones even just your medium lubricant, lubricant choices can be well over a thousand dollars a year like well over for, for in a lot of cases and so you know do you want to spend your hard-earned money on that new helmet new glasses new kit new cycling shoes maybe put towards a cycling holiday or do you want to spend that money burning through drivetrain components that you could very 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 easily avoid burning through those drivetrain components with something as simple as making a different lubricant choice um, and the information is there, like all the testing is, is done and the testing is continuing. It's all there, open, free data on the website uh, for you to be able to see, you know, what, you know, should I, should I try a change and achieve a better outcome for my drivetrain and for my wallet? So even obviously really not even focused on those that are, you know, trying to save watts for racing. Uh, a huge focus really for zero friction cycling is you know, we want to cut down on just burning through chain rings, chains and cassettes because one, that's wasteful. Two, it's, it's very expensive for you. Um, and three, it's really easily avoided. And four is I want to also cut down on the amount of solvent that needs to, that is being used, I guess, when we think about the millions of households around the world that are maybe frequently solvent or degreasing uh, their, their wet lube chains to try to keep them clean. Uh, we can massively reduce that because where are all these degreases and solvents ending up? You know, they're usually not disposed of uh, properly or recycled. So um, again, the, the top lubricant choices just cut down on that by such a huge factor. So, um, so just really trying to push, um, I guess, that education and that point across. Uh, so yeah, all right, I'll stop rambling on that side of things now, but yeah, it's just such a big focus for zero friction cycling. Um, so I'll move now to the next uh, bit will be showing you how uh, I apply a wet contamination uh, to the test, so for the wet interval blocks. All right, yeah, so just uh, moving into the last part of uh, demonstration um, for the video one of the zero friction cycling uh, wear correlation test that we run. Uh, so this is adding the uh, wet contamination. And again, um, it's, a, it's a, I guess I found that keeping things simple uh, is the best way to make sure that you keep the repeatability of what you're doing very robust. Uh, these bottles are great, so um, we need to apply water under pressure. So we need to spray the chain with water to sort of mimic uh, what is coming off your front wheel, although it is spraying it a bit harder. Uh, it doesn't, the aim is not to necessarily um, be exact for trying to mimic what's happening in real world, because real world changes all the time anyway. The main aim is to make sure that I'm doing the same thing every time and that I can repeatedly apply the dry contamination and the wet contamination in the exact same way every time so that I can consistently benchmark a lubricant's performance um, in such conditions. So uh, this uh, I can again pump up with my uh, compressor uh, with an extremely accurate gauge. Um, so 500 ml of water will be um, put into the uh, spray bottle and then this is pumped up to exactly 50 psi and then the water is sprayed onto the chain from a position very close to where it would be uh, being sprayed with water from the front tyre. Um, I found through testing that thankfully um, I don't actually need to spray the water and contamination all mixed in at the same time. Um, you kind of think you would, but it turns out that, um, that you don't need to. Um, you get much, much higher wear uh, rates with the wet um, contamination blocks applied exactly as I'm doing now, um, which is great because trying to do it uh, at the same time, so having the contamination mixed in with the, uh, with the water, uh, it, that increases the difficulty a lot because it's very easy for nozzles to get clogged um, and going down or, try, or solving that was, was proving to be a, a bit tricky. So it um, turned out that uh, through a whole bunch of back-to-back uh, -back testing that simply applying the water, then the, uh, the, dry, the contamination, we get the, the wet conditions wear rates uh, quite easily. So, uh, so we've got our 
a pressure spray bottle. Uh, it's moved into position and it is just simply sprayed directly onto the chain. Uh, this is the same chain that we did the, um, the dry application before, so just continuing on hammering this one for the moment for demonstration purposes. Uh, the the 500 mil at um, the 50 psi pressure takes very close to exactly a minute uh, to to spray, um, which is handy because it makes it easy to double check as well that uh, nothing's changed um, with regards to the pressure bottle. Once it gets to there, I stop, and then so exactly the same as before. The dry contamination is released. And that is uh, the wet contamination uh, application. So again, in the wet contamination block, uh, that is uh, done seven times throughout the 1,000 kilometer test block. And the extreme contamination block uh, two of the bottles are used, so double the amount of water, double the amount of sandy loam, and it's applied twice as often, so a total of 14 times throughout the extreme contamination block, which is why not many lubricants make it through that, uh, that test block at all. So uh, that's that. Oh yeah, uh, by the way, uh, thanks for watching, and don't forget to uh, like and subscribe to the channel and other YouTube type things like share with your friends. Uh, so that'll keep you up to date with the latest low friction news and hints and tips. And um, yeah, also put any comments down below and I can uh, try to look at those and uh, take them into account for future episodes.